Robbie, what's on your radar today? Well, Brianna, affirmative action is, of course, in front of the Supreme Court this term. Students for Fair Admissions, a group that would like to end race-based admissions practices in higher education, has filed a lawsuit against Harvard University. And SCOTUS has already heard oral arguments in that case. Now, a recent report in the New York Times, which cites information in the lawsuit and then also interviews with Asian applicants and college advisors for elite universities, reaches a startling conclusion that I wanted to discuss on the show and should, I think, provoke considerable alarm about the racism wrought by Harvard's policies. That conclusion is that Asian teenagers are taught, implicitly and explicitly, to appear less Asian on their applications. This is from the New York Times piece, quote, in interviews, college admissions consultants spoke about trying to steer their Asian American clients away from so-called typically Asian activities, such as Chinese language school, piano, and Indian classical instruments like the venue flute. They had other tips, too. Writing about your family's immigrant hardship stories is too basic, and don't bother checking the race box on the common application. Unless you're Latino or black, doing so may not hurt your chances of getting in. Won't help you either. One college admissions counselor said, it doesn't make me happy to tell ninth graders that there are musical instruments they shouldn't play or academic pursuits they shouldn't engage in because it's going to make them look bad. Joining us now to discuss all of this is Kenny Zhu, author of An Inconvenient Minority. Thanks for joining us, Kenny. Thanks for having me. So I saw you had a great interview uh, with my colleagues at Reason, Nick Gillespie and Zach Weissmuller the other day, and I wanted to bring you in to continue that conversation. I read this New York Times piece. Uh, it was just pretty, I, I think, alarming uh, for general audiences to learn um, what specifically Asian um, young people, applicants to elite universities, the kind of self uh, self censoring self it's beyond that Ch you know choosing their what their activities are what they're interested in really d dis almost disguising themselves in order to fool admissions counselors that that I, I think you would argue are you know are, are looking to weed out people that they think for some reason are are too similar something of that nature what's going on here yeah, well, let's be clear. You can't fool Harvard admissions officers because they have consulting companies that will take a look at every part of your background, whether you like it or not. They will evaluate you on your race, whether you like it or not. You can put you can put the no race box. You can even put white, but they will look you up. They will find you. They will because they're obsessed with this. And, and this is this this is the reality of Harvard admissions. In, 19, in the 1970s, the Supreme Court allowed schools like Harvard to use race admissions and then reaffirmed it in 2003 at Bruder versus Bollinger. And the result of this is a culture at Harvard where race is the goal. Um, when race is allowed, race becomes the goal. That's just what happens. They say it's holistic admissions, but every part of their system, a D Department of Justice investigation against Yale, for example, found race as a plus factor used four times in the admissions process from the first committee to the final committee uh, uh, on evaluation, they will use race as a plus factor. They will give you a plus factor if you are, happen to be African-American and a minus factor if you happen to be Asian. And, and one other aspect of this that I wanted you to touch on uh, from reading the lawsuit and coverage of the lawsuit is the idea that Harvard and institutions like them want, um, they want their students to represent um, a, a sort of a, the sparse country idea. Can you talk about that? Well, we have to, you know, if we have someone from, I don't know, rural South Carolina, they, they have to embody what, you know, what we would want from an applicant from that place and how that would, that would work against applicants of all sorts of races, actually, who, who are not, who would not, you know, be for cultural or historical reasons, wouldn't be, have been considered from that place in, in a really backward looking way that would work against Asian applicants, but really all, all sorts of people who, who, who wouldn't fit a stereotype almost, like they're trying to reinforce a stereotype. Yeah, in my book, An Inconvenient Minority, I talk about Harvard's geographic diversity justification. So basically, Harvard comes up with this idea, which they might implement after the Supreme Court um, uh, uh, admonishes them in court on this race-based admissions, but they might implement this geographic diversity policy, which says, well, we want fewer kids from San Francisco and fewer kids from New York City, uh, and we want to get into the geographic diversity part, which is, of course, a proxy for race. Um, they, this is exactly what New York City did uh, under Mayor Bill de Blasio to get rid of Asians in the specialized high schools, which are the elite uh, public high schools in New York City. 
they said, we're going to target people by zip code and we're going to allow a certain number of people from each zip code. And then the zip codes that, that they happened to discriminate against happened to be the majority Asian zip codes. But I, I'm sorry, wouldn't that also cause them to discriminate against all of the diverse people who tend to live in cities, including Latinos and African-Americans? The, the, the zip codes that you point to, places like New York, concentrated areas in the country, are notably more diverse. And when you look at maps of America, this is something that happens every election cycle. There are large swaths of the country that are much whiter, and there are political consequences for that, obviously, much redder, precisely because there's such a lack of geographical diversity outside of the cities. Yeah, it's not going to uh, be Racial perfect. diversity, rather. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, you know, um, there's a reason why Harvard is defending the explicitly race-based part of their admission system, because they want a more perfect um, admission system according to their race-based ideology. They have a, you know, a racial goal of getting a certain number of blacks in the school, a certain number of Hispanics in school. The geographical diversity would make it harder for them to do that, but rest assured, they still have that goal. Well, Kenny, can, can let me ask you this. When the affirmative action programs were ended in some of these UC schools, what you saw was a growth in the Asian population and a detraction in significantly the white population as well. And I think there's been a long history in the United States of America of various successful groups being kind of quoted out of universities historically, Jewish people in a lot of these Ivy League schools, and now Asian Americans. I will say that I've seen this firsthand in the hiring process. I've seen the kind of statements made about, you know, I don't know if I'm going to get along with this person, and I don't know if there's going to be a good cultural fit. And I think there's something really real there in the way that Asian Americans in particular have had to suffer the burden of, I think, what are as good aspirations to make sure that everyone has equal access to these educational systems. But my approach here would be to say the real problem is to have such a hierarchical education system where people feel so cutthroat and uh, about uh, and will go through anything, including getting thrown into jail, as we saw from a. Uh, Aunt Becky from uh, Full House in order to get their kids into school, and I, I wonder what you have to, what you think about the kind of systemic failure here, or if you just want to be able to take advantage, or, or what different kinds of students to be able to take advantage of a system that is already very hierarchical and keeps the vast majority of Americans boxed out, point blank, period. Well, what you say is true. There are different kinds of students, and that's why I'm skeptical of the claim that we can uh, ever eliminate the cutthroat nature of this admissions process. Um, as long as there will be ambitious people or ambitious parents, there will always be a cutthroat culture. That's just the case. And unfortunately, Harvard actually justifies their discrimination in the name of eliminating cutthroat culture. Because here's what happens. Harvard selectively recruits from these private schools, elite private schools like Exeter, that they have relationships with. The purpose of these private schools is to make it easier on the rich parents uh, to say, you know, just because my kid goes to this private school, he has an in with Harvard and Yale. And so it is actually easier and it actually is less stressful for these private school kids because they know they're going to have a higher chance for admissions. You know what happens because of this system? It makes it harder on the Asian Americans and on the people of all races who are high achieving who don't have to have those ends. Well, and you're, you're kind of, yeah, uh, moving around another thing I wanted to ask you before we have to let you go, which is about, right, the tremendous advantage given to legacy um, admissions. Uh, and that, honest, I, I believe, will probably work against Asians in a, you know, de facto racist way, um, perhaps even more so than the race-based admissions. 36% um, of Harvard's class is legacy admissions. Yeah, yeah. So what do, you, what do you think about that whole system, whereby, you know, the scions of wealthy, influential, well-connected uh, alums, you know, get moved to the absolute front of the line? The solution that I've always advocated for is meritocracy, strict meritocracy in admissions. That means admissions based on grades, test scores, a personal essay that you can't cheat on, so hopefully one that you have to take in uh, you know, one sitting, um, teacher recommendations, things that are commonly agreed on in merit-based factors. I would even go so far to say race-blind and name-blind. Uh, admissions officers are not allowed to look at your name. They're not allowed to look at your race. They're not allowed to look at your background. Just make the best presentation you can and win. Hmm. Kenny, I think that's I think that's very aspirational, but I think that part of the reason why folks have, some people, folks advocate for, let's say, 
put more emphasis on the test because some of those other factors are not neutral. Teacher recommendations are highly susceptible to the same kind of biases I've observed against Asian Americans in the hiring co context, for instance. And people, you, you talked earlier about Asian Americans being d uh, discouraged from, say, playing a violin or certain kind of stereotypical instruments. But the part of the push to push those, uh, to play those kinds of instruments this is because for years they were understood to give you such an advantage in the college application game, even though so many kids, the majority of kids, don't have families that can afford to give them lessons or to even give them SAT tutoring, which is something that I know up to my scores by many percentage points enabled me to get into Harvard. So what do you make about the balance between some of these factors actually undermining the idea of actual meritocracy and actually being a better map for these class issues? That's because nobody wants to play violin because they actually like playing violin. Um, no, <laughs> well, the, as, a, as someone who had to play the uh, violin since she was five years old, I have to agree with that. <laughs> uh, no, I mean, no, I don't get me wrong. I know the squash parents. I know the parents that, you know, put their kid through squash so that they can get into Princeton at the age of six. But um, but no, I, people should be allowed to pursue whatever aspirations they have and not use it docked one way or the other against them. Uh, in terms of teacher recommendations, I believe in the power of choosing your teachers, but I, I do acknowledge that sometimes that works against you. Um, a lot of immigrant parents, they have no idea like how to teach, how to make their teachers, how to pick their teachers. Um, so I would be supportive of an even more constrained admission system when you're based more on objective merit-based factors. Mm. Well, Kenny, thank you so much for joining us today. We really appreciate it. Thank you. We'll have more Rising right after this.